Welcome to the Fusion Party of Australia Member Profile Podcast. You're very welcome. Take up a seat and listen to what they have to say. Yay! I'd like that. Oh my God, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to have you on, Christopher. Just a bit about Christopher. Christopher is a new member to the Fusion Party uh, just in July. And I had the pleasure of speaking with him and just to catch up um, more about why he joined Fusion and his background. So Christopher, would you be happy to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, obviously, name Christopher. Um, last name probably not worth mentioning at the moment because that's probably going to change uh, in about eight months or so. I'm going to get married and oh, <laughs> we're wow. probably not taking my last name. Oh, yeah, my. at the moment it's Juba, um, but there's a D and a Z in there, so work that one yeah. out. Yeah, I'm actually curious um, what your where your last name comes from. Poland. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, it's Polish. Yeah, it's a weird one. You usually expect uh, Polish last names to end with ski. Something mm. ski. Um, no, it's one of the weird ones that just doesn't make sense. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, geez, like, um, I guess there where is do you a lot come from? What, what's your context? Where I come from? Who are Even you? Even that what is you... complicated. Like, who tall, am I? Short. Like, I'm, there's too much story to tell. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm tall. I'm um uh, just a, a white boy living in Adelaide at the moment. I was born in Adelaide. Um, and at some point moved to Poland when I was 14. Wow. Uh, my family's Polish. So we were there for two years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went to school there. I spoke Polish there. Um, it was difficult for my siblings. I've got three siblings, mm -hmm. a younger sister and two younger brothers. And they found it a lot more difficult than I did. I grew up um, up until about the age of four or five before going to school, speaking Polish at home. Um, and they didn't get that privilege, you know, mm -hmm. Um and so when I was at school there, like, yeah, I found it kind of difficult. It wasn't my first, it was technically my first language, but it wasn't the language I knew the best. Um, but I managed and they didn't. So we decided to move back, um, even though uh, parents' hearts were in Poland, moved back here and we decided to move to Victoria because it was slightly colder and temperature was one of the reasons they wanted to move back there. I spent a good long time in Victoria. Um, and then because of the property market, decided to move back to Adelaide, um, where I have finally managed to get a house. That's recent. That's like a month ago. Wow, rad. Just got our first house. Yeah, I know. Insane. <laughs> Only five years of saving. Thumbs up. Wow, good on you. Everything's coming together. And um, and also Yagshamesh. <laughs> Did I say it right? <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> what? Oh, Yagshamesh. Oh, got my it. God. Sorry. <laughs> I should have said it more Borat. <laughs> Yagshamesh. <laughs> I, I was so surprised when I realized that was an actual Polish word and not just something Borat made up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's it it's um he he like he mixes it all together into one word. It's three words. Yak she mash. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, yeah, I butchered that. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, yeah. that's cool. Okay, so you can speak Polish. Um I'm I'm just curious. And you don't have to answer this, but um, have your parents influenced your political leaning at all? They did, for sure. Like one of the things that I recommend to anyone, um, if you know they feel safe to do so, is to move out of home and start experiencing different cultures, different people. Share house as much as you can. You know, share your life with other people other than the people within your family, because you don't realize just how abnormal you know your upbringing is or how um how much variety there is to the way that people grow up and their political views and their perspectives very good point you know, variety yes yeah and it doesn't mean you have to change your views you, obviously nothing says you have to change your views that is entirely up to you changing your views is a lot of work mm -hmm. um yeah my family's very christian and a lot of my personality traits a lot of my views on the world were shaped by that sort of culture. Obviously, there's a lot of denominations and variety to Christianity, but mm. um, Pentecostal Christian um, is the variety that I came from. And I guess over time, after having had moved out, I um, grew out of my faith, changed um, my perspectives on a lot of different things, came across a lot of different views that challenged the way that I looked at the world. And, um, it, you know, till this day, I'm still discovering things that were defaults for me. Mm. Um, 
that I'm now realizing were things that I just never had an opportunity to question because that's what was given to me by my family. That's the culture that I was brought up in. Yeah. I was very lucky to not grow up with any sort of religion. I just remember um, it, it kind of made me feel like a bit of an outsider uh, when I didn't know all the the Christian stories. Like people would mention John the Baptist. And I'm like, who looks that? Like, I have no idea. I still don't really know, <laughs> actually. I never looked into it. But <laughs> I did read the whole Bible, but that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, look, uh, just if it makes you feel any better, a majority of Christians haven't actually read through the entire Bible. It's a big, complicated, and, and for the most part, really boring, repetitive book. Mm, um, it, it is an excellent historical mythology, in my opinion. Mm. And it does a really good job of reflecting people's values from mm. the Bronze Age. And and that's about it. Like, I don't oh, remember what the significance of it was. Uh, you know, did he heal people afterwards? I don't know. I don't um, A lot of Baptists believe that you can't actually get into heaven unless you are baptized. Oh, okay. Um, and you'll find that Catholics baptize babies. So you don't choose to be a baptized. You get baptized right after, you know, essentially you come out of the mother. Yeah, wow. Um, no consent. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's a weird one, but like that means you don't have the opportunity to not get into heaven. I don't know how it works with Catholics, especially because there's also variation in the Catholic denominations. Mm, that's interesting um, because I mean, all right, just jumping to something adjacent. Um, I'm thinking about Catholics and their position on contraception, and I, it's just a funny thing because if the people don't have a say on whether they uh, fulfill a pregnancy or not but then as soon as the baby comes out they still don't have a say whether the, the baby gets baptized or not it's a lot of control isn't it yeah. there's a lot of non-consent no, going on there a lot of non-consent a, a lot of um just the complete denial of bodily autonomy ah mm. um, uh, yeah I found it very so I'm I'm very lucky that I never had to battle that kind of change in worldview and I mean just I think it's very commendable the people who grew up in religious families and then started to ask those questions and question their worldview and question their parents, which is a pretty confronting thing to do, I think. Even yeah. for some adults still don't feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> so for a child, oh, yeah. pretty impressive and would also be very stressful. You know, you have to reconstruct the way you perceive reality and your value framework and and that's... That's confronting. Yeah. Yeah. I was speaking I mean, I'm to... not going to say it was a piece mm. of cake, but like it, you're, you're on the right track. Like you're completely right. Most people, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, will really have a tough time coming to terms with the fact that they are now an atheist. Nobody just decides, you know, uh, that they don't believe in God anymore. It happens over time. Yeah, you'll question I... one thing. One thing will doubt you. You'll notice an inconsistency here, there. And at some point you just have to accept, hey, you know, like, I can't in good faith say that I believe a God exists anymore mm -hmm. and coming to terms with that within yourself and then having to find, you know, people within the community that you've grown up with people in the community that you, you know, that have raised you finding somebody in that community to share that information with and then have them judge you for it. It's, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, but, well, I'm curious, yeah, like, what, what led you down this path? You did mention that you'd notice inconsistencies or was it kind of like a confronting crisis event that did that? It, look, it wasn't really a confronting crisis. Um, I, my family was very accepting of what happened and what led to it is literally just me moving out and not having to go to church every single week, mm. me moving out and, and sort of being detached from that community for a little while oh. um, and seeing people from different you know, perspectives gave me the opportunity to think to myself okay well I'm at a point where I have to justify it I have to justify my perspective because I need to be able to share that with people I can't just say hey I'm a Christian I don't know why that wasn't good enough for me mm. so I well thanks uh, it's just the way I think though it's very autistic no well you <laughs> it's are like yeah. you took ownership you have accountability and you were being self-reflective and self-aware and that's really good Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the thing like, is, like, I questioned myself and then I said, um, sorry, uh, you know, like, why? I, essentially, the question that I was really asking myself is, why do I believe? Um, and the answer that I got to that was because I wanted to. And I realized that that was really 
the main thing driving it. Like you have to really boil it down to the final factor. You can't just say, hey, I believe in God because, hey, I found this evidence and now I can satisfy um, this feeling that I have. You really need to dig deep and find out where that feeling came from mm-hmm. and where that instinct came from because that's what's really driving you. Uh, and understanding yourself to that level is, I feel, fundamental. You don't just expose, you know, your justification that you can share with people. You also expose to yourself where your vulnerability lies, because if that's what it's attacked, yeah, you're, you're going to be in a serious trouble. So it's better to understand yeah. yourself. Yeah, discovered was that like I only believed in God because I wanted to, because I liked the idea at the time, um, and I realized that that wasn't good enough for me. Um, and it's not like it was an instant. Oh, okay, I guess I'm an atheist now. It, it was just like. Uh, I started to sort of scramble and, and look for better support. Uh, and the more I looked, the f- further I strayed. So I just want to finish up this and then we can move. But I just wanted to ask, so at what age was this that you started to drift? A uh, solid 18 to 19. Finished high school, went to university and university was far away from home, uh, which um, gave me good incentive to move out of home. And that's when I started getting exposed to different cultures and different ways of thinking. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So it wasn't, you weren't propelled by a stressful event, like you said, and it was just really being outside of that routine um, and outside of the community, because I hear from people who do leave their faiths, losing the community is the hardest bit and probably the bit that really keeps them in there. So, huh. Interesting. How did you come across the fusion party? We're not well advertised. I don't know what people are saying about us in the community. I guess, how did you hear about us and what was the thing that just really clicked for you that you thought, yeah, I want to join this party? Oh, man. Um, actually, it wasn't the fusion party that I felt like joining. Originally, when I first started voting, I, I wanted to do my due diligence and, and, and research the different parties that are out there to see the ones that really reflect my values the most. And atheism has become somewhat a part of my identity, not just uh, you know a result of how I grew up. The secular party really stood out to me. You know, the idea of separation of church and state felt like it was a really good way to progress society a little bit better. You know, a really good way to sort of point out to people the difference between the effects of the church on society and the effects of just good hard work. Mm -hmm. And that became my default. Every time I went to elections, I would vote secular party first. One year, the elections come up and I I noticed that the secular party isn't there anymore. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, who's going to be the number one vote? And I discovered that the fusion party is obviously the new mother of all of my favorite parties in one place, blew my mind. So I've known about you guys for a while. You've always been like my number one vote. And then recently uh, it's gone to a point where I I kind of feel a little bit powerless in fighting the sort of destructive nature that I see uh, in religion on my own. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I wanted to become part of um, something bigger. And I just want to clarify, I I don't think that we need to eliminate religion. I'm not against people having faith in the sense that, sorry, my dogs are being so freaking No, that's okay. I mean, yeah, that's that's something that definitely needs to get out there because when I speak to people, when they hear the word secularism, for some reason, they think that that means anti-religion and it's against religious freedom. That's what they think. I've I've heard that from people. And I think that's something being spouted by the um, Australian Christian lobby, ACL. Yeah, they're very, they're very against anyone who cares about secularism and I've even heard this rhetoric going around about Calvary Hospital was overtaken by the ACT government and it was pushed through quite quickly. People jumped onto that and and they were like, why is this happening? This is anti-religion, it's against religious freedom. I looked into it a little bit. It is concerning that they may have bypassed due process. But the one thing that stood out for me as um, pushback against the takeover by the government was the freedom for that Catholic run hospital to have a moral opinion on abortion services. And I thought for me as a, you know, ex-pharmacist, healthcare worker, ah, it is just so frustrating to have that anti-science sentiment, have an opinion on a science-based service. It's just, yeah. and, and that's why I like the idea of secularism, separate religion from government. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you know, there is a crossover. There's a, there's a, point where somebody's decision has a market impact on other people's lives but if somebody decides they want to do what they want with their own body they want to do what they want with their own life they want to get married to whoever they want that's their choice and it 
doesn't really affect you, you don't have the right to encroach on that space. And mm. I understand because I've been a Christian that um, compromise always looks like it's just them slipping their foot in the door. It's just them trying to gain more and more territory into our world. And you feel suppressed. You feel like your religion is under attack when the truth is people are just fighting for their right to make their own what you might think is a mistake, but make their own decisions that don't really affect you. Hmm. Um, and that's why, you know, secular humanism is such an important thing to me because, you know, I can see that margin now. I can see where it's no longer a matter of compromise. It's a matter of a division of interest. It's, it's a matter of, you know, people having control where they don't have the right to. Hmm. Well, it's a nice ideal. We'll, we'll see how far we can get in our lifetimes. Yeah, but, and you know the um, funny thing is as well. I think secularism was a pretty strong movement, maybe a little while ago, with Richard Dawkins and and his atheist writings. There was a time when people were un- unquestioning about their religion. They really had to have that aggressive atheist push come through, and the secularist movement and secular party came through because they really had to push for that secular mindset. I think across the majority, maybe it's not a high priority, but it's still a priority for people who move out of religion and want to have that more fair and objective view of managing government. That's all it is. So thank you for that. Uh, so you came across Fusion because of the secular party. How are you finding it so far? I've noticed um, because you're you're new, you've joined our monthly meeting, you've had our newsletter. How's it been so far? What What is your thought of it outside of the secular policies that we have? I mean, honestly, it seems like a really close community. Uh, with a lot of shared values um, that's in its baby stages. It sounds like you guys have just recently started to nut out the more important details, some of which I don't even completely understand. I'm not, you know, familiar with exactly how a party functions. Um, mm-hmm. But from what I can see, um, you guys have a, a clear idea of what um, the mutual policies are that are agreed upon by the members. You've got consistent pattern of like meetings and, um, you know, a community on Discord. So, um, yeah, yeah, well, ask like away. It, Feel free. It's, I mean, it's exciting. Like, yeah, drop questions yeah. in the Discord. I mean, we make sure that we're very transparent and accessible as much as possible. Uh, we're learning things as we go as well, because when we started to embrace radical transparency, there was the whole idea of, well, how transparent? But I think we're transparent <laughs> where we'll share everything except maybe our, our inbox, you know? <laughs> Maybe that yeah. will change. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like transparency um, is obviously a complicated subject because, you know, you're you're encroaching on people's space. But, like, I feel like the way it should work is with you becoming more vulnerable and exposing more of yourself and exposing more information about yourself should come with some incentive. The more somebody chooses to share information about themselves, the more um, they should expect some sort of benefit such as recognition for the things that they should be proud of. Mm. Um, or I don't know, it's, it's really hard because I haven't really thought about an example in terms of how that would work with a party exposing, you know, all of its conversations, but in terms of voting, um, and this is a baby thought that I had like a couple of months ago, one of the biggest issues that people have with voting is that it needs to be completely secure. Every vote needs to be completely private. Oh, yeah, um, we, we have know. that. Yeah, because you don't want to be able to influence people's vote. You know, if you know what somebody's yeah. voting, you don't want somebody to be um, penalized for it. Mm. And so there's a lot of vulnerability in telling people what you're going to be voting for. But yes. there yeah. could be a benefit where if you expose, you know, what your vote is going to be or your, your preferential votes are going to be because we have preferential voting. The benefit could be that you can now just vote online. It doesn't matter if your information is found out. You've already Mm -hmm. deliberately exposed it. So you can now vote from home. That could be an advantage. You can also use that information to further bolster your opinion. Like you could tell people, you know, beforehand what you are going to be voting for, but you don't necessarily have to back that up. Now Mm -hmm. with the ability to share that information, you know, you're able to confirm your values with people rather than just making a baseless claim. Hmm. So, ah, I don't know. Some people could even argue that yeah. the voting, um, the the idea of democracy that we have now isn't actually a legit democracy. I mean, the only say we have is once every three years. I would really like to embrace electronic voting and, 
And if people are worried about exploitation, then that means we have to actually have more accountability and transparency and integrity in government. I think this is pretty much the the priority to end all priorities and something I'm really focused on. So I, I really want Fusion to be the uh, demonstrated example of that as well. If we want to see it in government. I, I was just like that. I, I could not understand for the life of me, why the hell would anybody want to do anything other than online voting? You know, it seems like intuitively something that can be secured, something that can be made to work, but there's a huge number of vulnerabilities technically involved in online voting. And it's actually happened in a few countries where they've tried online voting and it has been manipulated. Mm. The problem is, is that as much as the government can be completely honest, transparent, and perfectly do everything right in terms of organizing online votes, it can still be exploited by a third party. I agree with that. But I think what I'm thinking more about is better uh, accountability for government anyway. So even if we had a completely legitimate election and the vote was not compromised or exploited at all, we still get bad people in government. And I think just even requesting that they follow the law uh, or even having some way to just kick out poor performers or frequent disruptors, like that should happen. Like we, we should have better trust that government is run better because if we're so protective of the vote as if that is the most authentic and only way that we can elect a good government if that's the only way that we have protection where we're avoiding the yeah. bigger problem which is how government is run rather than votes being exploited you know what that is you're right a huge can of worms we don't have to open right now <laughs> yeah uh yeah that's um, like that's a whole thing to discuss another time like uh, what even is democracy and, and what do we need it to be well functioning and things like that that's definitely worth diving into another time as well Yes. Yeah, okay, definitely cool. needs to be protected though. Um, nice. I just sent through a link of somebody much smarter than me sort of explaining a little bit of the history. It's a very short video. It's like a three minute video um, with citations explaining the different sort of things that have happened in the past and the ways that electronic voting can be exposed. I have you made another that. video. Yeah. But how crazy yeah, is that, that I've seen too. that you've shared me that, that is that like the only resource that people refer to just that one? <laughs> Why do we need more we spend a lot of time on YouTube absorbing a lot of information very, very quickly. Yeah. I don't blame people for citing um, YouTube as a source of information. Oh, I no, do that's fine. blame them for taking it as gospel, but um, I, I tend to try and stick to the videos that cite their sources because then it's oh, like yeah. fall back in. For sure. But I mean, uh, what I'm saying is um, across all of the YouTube universe, we hang on just to a few common um, sources. That's, that's interesting. There's a lot yeah. of information, too much. Um, and so I think it's a real good skill to be able to organize that information, make it succinct, to make it accessible. So mm. I've been thinking a lot about um, what is required for integrity, uh, accountability, and transparency, because it's not just about government. It's about everyday life. I mean, we see it in the workplace as well or, or groups. Um, people want to get shit done and they want to have trust that it's done well. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think even with transparency, some people can do that in a faulty way. The thing is for adequate transparency, you really need good quality data in the first place. And you need that data to be timely, it needs to be real time, and it needs to be easy to understand. You don't want just like a CSV raw data dump kind of thing. And they're like, oh, here's the data, we're transparent. Um, and so there are examples where I was just informed recently that MPs, they have a parliamentary expense account where they have the freedom to just expend a certain amount of money on, on whatever they like, so even their own campaigning. And they have no obligation to report on their expenditure, but even less of a, a reason to report now because apparently their database is broken, so they, they don't have the data to report. They're like, oh, sorry, it's broken. And to me, I'm just like, well, that just fails on accountability. So I think if you if you fail on accountability or transparency measures, then you're failing integrity. And then when you're failing integrity, you're failing trust. I've been thinking a lot about this and I, I really just want to get it very organized and neatly packaged as a, a guide for people to, to suss out when integrity is being undermined and how to call yeah. it out and how to fix it. I think that's, that's my mission. <laughs> yeah. There needs to be a bit of an induction to how to read the information as well. I mean, one thing I find is that 
no matter how accessible you make information, when you're trying to explain a complicated story of how funding is being used, where it's going and what that means, you can make that information as presentable as you like. Because there's so much information there, because there's so much to absorb, there needs to be some sort of induction on how to read that information to begin with as well, mm. you know? Yeah, um, I mean, that's definitely an, definitely an approach. I guess I want to avoid um, having so too many steps, too many barriers. So yeah, yeah, should definitely have some education, but and I know it's extra work for them. But if they can make the data just readable, there's a really good website called politicalgadgets.com. I don't know how I came across it, but it's just blown my mind. And uh, I was very lucky. I hit up the admin of that website and had a chat with him recently. Yeah, I was I was just like I am amazed with this. It is just crazy. So have fun with that and let me know what you think. <laughs> um, because I think, you know, the cool thing about that tool, I just realized when I was talking to him, people don't trust mainstream media anymore because it's corrupted, obviously, compromised. Um, but there's a whole bunch of independent outlets like the Klaxon and Michael West Media, Friendly Geordies, all of them. And the thing is, they're really good at gathering information and organizing it and explaining it, but it's still through a certain filter you know and you're being dictated a narrative from from that author and the most that you can really do after reading an article like that is feel outraged and share it with your friends but the thing I like about the tool is you kind of choose your own journey there choose your own adventure and it's out of the the person's curiosity that they start to put together their own narrative and start to see the reality there without waiting for someone to do that for them so you know if it crosses your mind hey I wonder uh which companies donated to both parties. He's got data on that. Or if you're like, oh, I wonder if Woolworths donated more to the Liberal Party or the Labor Party. And then you can use that accessible data to just start to do your own inquiry and put your own story together. And then when you have that authentic firsthand knowledge, you share that with your your friends and family. And that's probably a lot more compelling than just sharing someone's article. So I think, yeah, gadgets like that are fucking amazing. Yeah, I love the dot no meter. It's hilarious. Yes. A very um uh divisive use of Yeah. Actually I, I gotta check because there used to be <laughs> a website yeah. called it's by the people who go they vote for you. I love they vote for you. I don't understand why it took me so long to figure out I that, know. that website exists. Yeah. Open Australia Foundation. Because they have a database, it's called Right to Know. And it's, it's like a database of all the freedom of information requests. I wonder if Political Gadgets is going to have something like that. That would be really good. I love that. I'm all about that. Um, okay, cool. All right, so let's jump into your personal life, everyday, the day-to-day life of Christopher Juba. Did I say that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like just say Jabba the heart, but instead of <gasps> ah, it's oh, Juba. Juba. Oh, like tuba. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's actually, that's better. (laughs) Christopher Juba. Nice. So yeah, what do you do? You've just recently moved to Adelaide. You studied robotics. Yeah, tell us. I mean, I've wanted to make things ever since I was a little kid. That is like my destiny. I was born knowing what my destiny is. And that's just to make stuff. Didn't really care about friends. Eventually learned how to make those, which is probably crucial to my development. But in the end, my biggest interest has always been learning how to produce functional things. And that led me to studying mechatronics robotics at uh, Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. Um, And I didn't finish my course. So there's that. But the reason I didn't finish my course is because I got into a industry related job. So I'm not technically an engineer, but I do engineer style work where I work with CAD, computer aided design. I make 3D models. I make technical drafts for clients to approve. And then I make information to send to a factory floor where the things that I drew are cut on a CNC, the big electronic machines that cut wood, and information for the guys on the floor to build things together as well. This is all commercial joinery that I'm building. And so I'm working for a company in Melbourne from Adelaide now. We moved here about three years ago. Yeah, and that's pretty much the bird's eye view of my life at the moment. Mm -hmm. And when you walk into work every day remotely, are you working on just one project at a time or multiple things? I'm just trying to picture what you create. Because when you say joinery, I'm thinking um, joining corners together, but you said commercial. So what, what does that mean? Ah, Okay. Joinery, as a quick summary, is anything permanent in a house 
that isn't a wall or a service or a door, I guess. Your kitchen cabinets would be joinery. The banquet seats that you see, when you walk into like a pizza hut or a restaurant, all the seats and chairs, that's all joinery. Mm. When you walk into a shopping center, you know how all the shops have different fronts. They'll have like pillars or like inside when you walk in, they'll have different stands and displays holding up all the products. That's all joinery. So Mm -hmm. joinery um, is pretty much anything made out of panels. If you know what MDF is, medium density fiber board, if you go to Bunnings and you just look at the sheets of wood, anything that you make out of those is usually joinery. I'll check that out next time. Yeah. But um, commercial meaning um, we do like high end, you know, banquet seats. Um, One of the more impressive jobs that I like to boast about is we did Melbourne post office in the city. Um, so you walk in, you'll see a gigantic concierge desk. We built that as well as like a giant wall behind them with like a display. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Is that near Flinders Station? More or less, I guess. I mean, I could, I kind of measure everything by my ability to skate there. So I'd, I'd take me about five minutes to skate there from Flinders Street Station. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Longboarding is the best way to get around the city. Yeah. This is an objective truth, hands down. <laughs> um, How long have you been skateboarding? Yeah. I'm just curious. Oh, man, ever since, oh, geez, ever since I hit oh, the lady years of high school. So mm-hmm. it's been over a decade now, now that I think about it. It's been like 12 years. Mm, you've got a bit of a Marty McFly kind of vibe. <laughs> Nobody calls me chicken. Yeah. But if they did, I'd be okay with scientists. it. Well, skateboarding scientist. Well, adjacent. To, you're not the scientist, but yeah. It was no, a cool movie. I'm not the scientist. <laughs> it was such a cool movie. I wish, I wish I was more scientifically inclined. I wish that I had more education, especially in electronics and computer IT development. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm doing at the moment is essentially just pseudo engineering. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I had access to. And I was getting paid a decent amount. So, you know, I stuck to that industry. Mm -hmm. sort of following the flow that I had access to. And I do find myself extremely privileged to even be in this position because not many people find themselves into this role. Most people find themselves on the floor, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, and you still need training for that. I didn't get any training. I got into this industry because my mom was in this industry. My family comes from joinery. My family comes from, you know, building cabinets. Ah, Um, Generations and generations. My parents are the first generation. Did your parents hire you? (laughs) Uh, it kind of, my mum, the first time I got into the industry, my mum was changing states. She was working for a, a cabinet maker. You know, I put my hand out and said, look, I mean, if you're changing states and they're going to be looking for somebody, do you reckon it's possible for me to pop in for two weeks before you go? They can train me up and maybe I can get an actual job related Very to the thing good. that I want. Very good. Huh. Yeah. That's surprising. It was it's good. good opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Either that or the, she's convinced that she's the one that reached out to me. So you right. know, it depends on who asks the story. But I'll um, but I, yeah, um, I know what I believe. No, um, it doesn't matter. The the point is, I didn't accept the job there. It was extremely disorganized. They're a terrible business. Yeah. Um, but I made a strong enough impression to get a reference for another place that was looking for somebody, and that's how I got to working with the worst software on the bloody planet. If you okay, stay away from microvellum. It is the most colossal piece of shit that you will ever encounter in your life. And oh my God, don't even think about it. Don't even breathe it. Anything is better. Literally anything is better. Mm, just okay, just right. stay away from microphone. Vellum. Vellum. <laughs> yeah, to, to sort of move away from it. We've moved to Onshape, which is a browser-based CAD, which I recommend to anybody, not even in joiner, just anybody using CAD, use Onshape. Um, it, it's an amazing platform. This is it's not sort sponsored. of like if no no this is not sponsored i'm so impressed with them they're like i love google docs and the google sort of online platform and google sheets mm-hmm. and i love um some sort of parametric softwares like inventor or solidworks and this is as if solidworks and um google sheets had a baby like but better it's insane you know they come out with updates every three weeks anyway i could i could talk about this yeah no no, no that's, going that's to, cool yeah. we'll we'll save that for a niche podcast i think um <laughs> <laughs> chris's takes on cad software <laughs> it's the two right yeah uh, it's just those two i've i've looked into quite a few of them but okay <laughs> be short run um <laughs> we we have recorded quite a bit but uh, i want to get two questions when you speak to friends and fam or whoever you talk to closely, 
how do you describe Fusion and why you've joined? I I just describe you as like a, a data based science based party that's focused on what's real and how people feel. Nice. You did say that you joined us because we house the secular party. Um, I was going to ask why you haven't joined any other party. And is that because, you know, you don't really see strong secular policy from the other parties? Yeah, I guess so. You know, I, I mean, the f- focus on secularism is quite a high priority for me. I, I do obviously value a lot of the things that are associated with that, including animal rights, um, mm. environmental effects, nuclear energy, just transitioning to a more science-based future. But the Greens sort of reflect some of those values, but not all of them. And they don't really have a huge focus on secularism. The fusion just seems to be more aligned with my values. It's as simple as that. Nice. Okay. And then yeah. final question. If you were to just really tap into your imagination, how would you like to see Australia in the future? What is a aspirational vision for future Australia you'd love to see and, you, and don't really hear people talk about? Honestly, my vision of the future is a bit blurry. I mean, I haven't really thought about this too much. So it's a, it's a wild question. But if I was to force myself to come up with an answer right now, it would probably be something that people wouldn't even instinctually say is a good thing. Like there'd be a lot more, there'd be a lot more exposure of people's information. Information that people may not be too comfortable revealing right now. I feel like in the future, people will be a lot more willing to give up their information about the location when they're not, you know, places that are private to them there'd be a lot more access information but that information would be used to completely bolster every single person's life like information about how people feel when they feel that and what's caused that to happen information about how people sleep and what affects their sleep information about what causes decline in mental states a lot of that information would be collected a lot of that information would be used to advertise people but it would also be used to improve people's lives this is an I. This is not an ideal for me. This is just what I feel might end up happening. If we we're going to talk about an ideal future, I don't know. I really have no idea. I feel That's like okay. it's a really sh- a hard thing because, like, you want people to be independent. You want people to not be so reliant on each other and be able to live happy lives without waiting on handouts from other people. Mm. Like, but at the same time, we also want to be really united and make sure that we're all depending on each other to share resources and make each other's lives better. So uh, that's mm-hmm. a really hard, really hard one. No, I, I agree. And I think you've really resonated with Fusion's values. I mean, our base value um, that we want to see in the world is equity. And I think that's the only way we can really ensure that everyone has a good, fair chance at being able to enjoy the ideal, which is personal freedom. Yeah. So I think you've pretty much articulated that whole idea, which is really cool to hear. And yeah, I hear what you're saying about sharing the data. I think at the moment, as far as I understand it, private information or privacy protects your health information and your financial information, but everything else is on the table. I'd really like to get us to the point where we don't have to be so protective about our health information. I think that's that continues stigma. Even when I worked as a pharmacist, if we dispensed medication for um, HIV patients, we put it into a paper bag for privacy, even though everything that happens in a pharmacy is meant to be private, but HIV meds were extra private. And same with Viagra, like, oh, we don't want to embarrass them. They're taking Viagra. It'd be really good to get to the point where no one just has any stigma attached to those things. We're just like, oh, you have problems there? Let's fix it. I know this, I know that because of all this access and freedom of information. So it's really just accelerating advancement. If we can just let go of all those hangups and barriers and just fully dive into information. Yeah. Yeah. And that was our first episode of Fusion Party's member profile podcast, listening to people who bank on a new and emerging party to voice what they would like to see in Australia's future. Thank you for listening.